Good morning. Um, for those of you who um, didn't make it to our incredible afternoon session yesterday, uh, welcome to the new school. I'm Brian McGrath, the Dean of the School of Constructed Environments. And um, I'm one of the co-organizers of this event with Peggy Deemer on stage right uh, from Yale University. Uh, this event is also made possible by the Yale Equity and Design Group, uh, funded by the, Depar the Department of the Provost for Diversity. Um, and I'd also like to thank Joy, Reen, Howard, Andrew, um, for making this possible. Um, so, uh, I, Peggy, if you want to come up here and introduce our introductory speaker. Thanks. Um, let me say, too, um, how happy I am to see all of you. Um, for those of you who were not here, yes. Oh, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, I'll just say again how thrilling it is to see a group like this and be amongst many people who I admire and learn from. So um, thank you all for being here, presenters, attendants. Um, and I'll say again how pleasurable it's been working with, with Brian. Um, it, it's a um, very fun collaboration, so I, f I feel lucky for that. Um, I'll, I'll just go to it and introduce our, our um, morning speaker. Uh, Donna Robertson was the Dean of Architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology from 1996 to 2012. She now holds the John and Jean Rowe Chair in Architecture there. Prior to this, she was the Dean at Tulane from 1992 to 1969. Um, 1996, sorry, whoa. Um, all right. Um, and prior to that, she was the Director of the Architecture Program at Barnard College. Um, she's a registered architect and a partner of Robertson McNulty Architects. Um, she was the 2012 president of the Associate of College of Coll Collegiate Schools of Architecture, the ACSA, a board and member of NAAB from 1999 to 2003, vice president of the nonprofit Chicago Design Matters 2011 to the present, and she was recognized as the 2011 Most Admired Educator by Design Intelligence. She has spoken widely all over the world and in this consistently brought attention to the issues of equality in architectural education. She was a colleague and boss of mine when she was director of the architecture pro program at Barnard and there she was always a model of generosity, fairness and calm. I feel like I learned a lot about leadership from her and I consider it a privilege to call her a very, very good friend. So please welcome Donna Robertson. Folks, let's see if I can um, uh, go backwards. Brian? Ah, there you go. Hold there. I uh, just wanted you to see the web address. Um, <clears throat> ostensibly, I'm here to speak to you about some efforts that have gone on at ACSA, Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, in the past few years in order to advance this cause of um, the question of women in architecture, which is how I like to pose it. Um, a little history about me, since we were talking yesterday about how we convene because of the inspiration of Susanna Torrey, I thought it might interest you to know that coming out of school in 1978 from UVA, the best school in the world, um, <laughs> I'm saying this for Karen Van Lingen's sake. Um, no, really, it was a fantastic education for me. Um, it was a very special time in that school, and I could go on and on about what that will mean to anybody who's interested in becoming an architect when we get to talking about curriculum. Um, but uh, coming out of school in 78, I um, had met Susanna Torrey because she was a lecturer at the school. Yes, they were bringing in women when Ralph Lerner was chair there, um, or head of the lecture series, excuse me. And um, uh, so looking around for a job, um, Susanna made me an offer. Um, and so my first job was with Susanna as her one and only employee until she hired a receptionist. And uh, together we worked on her built work and also on her writings. And 
together we authored a, an article that I'm sure is no longer in cir circulation because I can't even remember where it was published. But I do remember the process of working on it with her. And she divided it up into dual voices. And the title of it was Inside Out and Outside In. And I had Outside In. And so thinking about what we talked about yesterday um, uh, and remembering that ex seminal experience with Susanna, um, perhaps that gives you a clue as to where I'm going with these remarks. You know, I have to apologize. I don't have the beautiful graphics that the rest of you have had and the really commendable ones that Karen showed yesterday to set up the condition for our meeting together. And um, I gleaned that those graphics were produced actually by a new person that we hired at ACSA in order to address this question of how we can make complex ideas clear through clear graphics. Um, and so that's been a kind of mission over the last three years for the organization. And I encourage you to go to their website. But I'm here to talk about something more specific that we did. Um, oh, but in keeping on background, you know, I'm going off this very small print here on the pad. Um, at IIT, you know, I, I had hoped that in my role as an architectural administrator, I was advancing the cause of women in architecture, um, something I've cared about all my career. Um, how overtly or covertly did I do that? Well, just as a for instance, when I came to IIT, there were 33% women enrolled in the program, and we managed to get that up to 50%. Um, and I had the unique experience of being the first female dean in the house that Mies built. <laughs> um, and that managed to last for 16 years. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons in that. It wasn't easy, but it was certainly a journey, and I wouldn't have given it up. Uh, one, two of the things that I concentrated on in advancing the cause was bringing in strong women faculty to the program who were practicing and teaching. Um, did we bring in enough women? No, not to make the 50-50 ratio. But um, I was able to bring in some really interesting and important women and then also concentrated on the lecture series to make sure that there were, uh, there was female representation. Um, and to hear the vo other voices through visiting guests, such as Natalie Dubois, or the way that we framed the competition for our Cool House Design Campus Center, where we managed out of five uh, finalists to have two women uh, competing. So I do think that we all work in our own ways. And um, I, I may not be the most theoretical of those of you here, but um, I would hope I've put some things in action. Um, in my term as president of ACSA, when I agreed to run for president, um, it was because people said to me, it's your turn. And so um, at the beginning, people would say to me, well, what do you want to do as president? And I said, not screw up. <laughs> and you know kind of keep the ship on an even keel but then i thought about it and, and and it's true it was an opportunity to do something um and through my road chair i am able to have some funding and so um i decided to take on this question of women in architecture and that's what we did from 2013 to 2014. Uh, we staged two um women's leadership council seminars in conjunction with the two annual conferences, the Administrators Conference and the big annual conference. Um, the first one was focused on aspirations of leadership. Let me back up and tell you what the Women's Leadership Council is within ACSA. It started out as an ad hoc group of people inspired by Beverly Willis and her foundation and then um, kind of precipitated by Geraldine Forbes Isis. Um, and taken up um, by a bunch of us who would just loosely aggregate for a, a talk session at every conference, and that was going on for six, eight years, I don't know. 
Um, and a few of us got a little tired of the fact that there were, because there were always new faces in the audience, it ended up being basically a, a, well, you could call it a gripe session or you could call it the sharing of experience session. And so um, Francis Bernay and I, uh, Francis having been a prime mover with that group, uh, thought that we would put together more developed programs. And so we had these two programs for 2013-14 that focused on the development, women's opportunities for uh, developing their careers and developing as leaders. And so the first one, um, you can read who was a participant. Um, in that one, we just heard from Francis and Sharon Matthews uh, about um, uh, their advice for leadership in the field. Um, I'll introduce these two seminars and then I'm going to try to flip to another program, just give you a brief overview of information that is up on the ACSA website about what these speakers had to say. Francis, you may know, had been on the faculty and a researcher at um, RPI. And Sharon Matthews had been a faculty member in, in, in a couple of schools in the Northeast before she took on being president of the NAAB, which she did for numerous years. And upon leaving there, transformed herself into a consultant on international education and architecture. And uh, there's no one in the states more knowledgeable about our opportunities in that way. Um, the second one, at the annual conference in Miami, See, we always go to fun places. <laughs> it's a given. Um, again, had Frances speak, speaking, and she invited um, Ellen Schmidt Devlin, who had been with Nike for 27 years and functioning as a product manager in Southeast Asia, um, and then left that to come back to the States. Uh, there's a long saga that you'll be able to read about why she left, having both to do with the fact that her husband was ready to come back and the kids were, had finally gone to college. Um, and so she remade herself as an educator um, and opened up one of the first, if not the first, um, degree in uh, product development um, that exists. Uh, or product management, I believe it is. Um, and uh, then uh, Sharon invited Kathleen Wilson because she's a very expert on the opportunities that the Fulbright program offers. And so she had wisdom about numerous things that you can find there. So why attend an ACSA conference? Because um, I was very interested in Corrado and Havenant's um, seeming to recommend against it. I don't know if I got that right. Um, but rather working in the grassroots. But I do think that, that, that these kinds of conferences um, are developed uh, annual opportunities that both give people a chance to get their ideas out there to be shared with colleagues and to and therefore have a voice um, and also to develop a community because a lot of the same people keep coming back and then there are also a lot of new faces that give you a chance to shall I use that word that's overused network um, and so you know you might want to just see what's up with those conferences if you're looking around for something to do um, Let's see if I can go to the PowerPoint. Uh, so some of the things that they talked about, Francis uh, in the first conference had a very developed, um, yeah, here we go, um, had developed information about, you know, what you need to do if you want to, think more long-term and strategize for developing a career because becoming a leader is not an accidental practice. And so there are a number of things that, uh, from her experience, um, she offers there. Um, one of the things that I liked was that she quoted um, 
Marvin Maleka and Bob Greenstreet, who used to give the new administrators workshop, and they, that's loaded with advice, and that's something that's offered at the administrators conference. And he, they said, get press for everything you do, but watch out for the public record. <laughs> so it's full of uh, insights like that. And then Sharon Matthews talked about um, uh, various international and national uh, agencies that offer opportunity for educators to um, put their knowledge at work in the field. Um, there's something called Education USA, for instance, and there are loads of websites that put forward um, these kinds of endeavors that most of us are not even aware exist for our pleasure. Um, so we had hoped to hear from that. And then um, when we went into the second conference, this one was focused on global opportunities and paths. And we heard from Devlin Schmidt and Wilson about um, kind of their career trajectory and the lessons that they learned from that. And uh, I told you a little bit about Devlin Schmidt in terms of, uh, Schmidt Devlin, oh, excuse me, um, uh, in terms of uh, you know, what she had learned from that experience she had. She had been running track at Oregon and she was approached by an executive at Nike, then a very new company, and he said, could you get the girls to try out some of our product? <laughs> and she turned around and said, yes, I can if you'll call them women. And, uh, <laughs> and that started her relationship with Nike. Um, uh, and she went between China, Thailand, and Japan. One of the things that interested me in her insights was she said that over the course of her career, she had developed the five people who would hire me, who would be my sponsors. We all know about mentors, but her concept was sponsors, people you keep in touch with across your career, whose work you admire, and you keep touching base with them, and um, both telling them what you admire about their work and hearing from them uh, suggestions for your work. Uh, and she reached this critical juncture at her Nike career where uh, the bottom fell out of the economy in Southeast Asia and she was suddenly without a job. And she had to look around and find the people who she had kept in touch with who might be inclined to hire her. However, this was back in 2003 and there was not a lot of hiring going on and that's when she made the switch to being an academic. Um, Kathleen Wilson is in another um, discipline in uh, terms of being a professor of voice at Florida International. Um, but she used the Fulbright opportunities over and over again to take herself down to South America and make contact with um, various schools in various countries and um, develop loose and informal exchange programs that both brought students to their university and faculty um, and gave her a chance to broaden her vision about voice education and um, academia in general. And the Fulbright program is amazingly accessible and it gives you paid, uh, uh, paid um, fellow status in another university. Um, the only stipulation being that you be a U.S. citizen. Um, and it's uh, open to all ranks of academia, tenured and untenured, and from every type of institution and of every discipline. And that's one of the things that Sharon had to say, that there's all this money sitting out there um, from these various national and international agencies that are ripe for architects to move into because they don't hear from them very often. And yet you can imagine that in developing countries, they're very interested in bringing in architects to advise them. Um, and, and she said, Fulbright pays well. So you, we were good to hear from that. Um, <clears throat> and so Francis had some closing remarks that were also back to um, just basic advice about how to shape a career and make it successful.
So the thing that struck me um, was that I guess the, the basic thrust of these seminars was to put women in front of the audience who were leading examples of a couple of things. And by the way, the audience was um, at the administrators' conference, of course, administrators. We, we had the smarts to, or ACSA had the generosity to give a free lunch. And we had robust audiences that included um, both genders, or maybe even more, I don't know. Um, and uh, if I look back on that experience, I think that putting these leading women in front of others, oh, I should have said, and we intended at the annual conference that it was going to pull in the junior academics who tend to come to those conferences to present and um, uh, you know, give them this information. But as I said, it's all up on the website and the value of having the administrators hear about it was that we exhorted them to take the information back to their junior faculty. Um, I think that what we were trying to do overall with these seminars was to put forward people who were willing to share about how they lived their life in order to have their career. Um, not that they went into gory details, but um, you heard from them how they put together a career, um, what their options had been and what they chose to do, and then in retrospect, I realized that they all, almost all, I mean, you could argue about Francis, but the others um, had a period in their career where they had to go through a major self-invention um, and make a decided career shift. And so it was fascinating to hear from them <clears throat> how they put that together. Uh, Back to the idea of having women as leading examples. That's why I was so moved when Karen Van Langen showed us yesterday the ACSA graphics about how many women offer lectures in any given year in the schools of architecture. I mean, that's the first leading indicator that we have something to do still. Um, and I was also interested to hear yesterday the, the concept of the 50-50 rule. Um, very inspirational. I know that it's harder to find the 50 when we look at the realities of architectural production over the ages, but that doesn't preclude us from addressing con the contemporary scene in a different way. And I do think that the talk yesterday was valuable in, um, or talks, I should say, in pointing out to us um, the way that we can um, rewrite history to our own age's needs and perspective. Um, and I would point to the talk we had yesterday on the um, parallels between Perot and, and Sejima. Um, and uh, pointing out the recent discovery of Lena Bobardi's work to North America, if not the world. Um, <clears throat> And yesterday's talks also put me in mind of another concept that I think of when I think of advancing the cause of women in the field. And it goes back to quite a while ago when Jennifer Bloomer introduced into our field the concept of valuing a minor practice. Because, you know, we saw that cliffhanger graphic about how many women are making it to the Pritzker Prize. But, um, you know, I think we're all working towards changing the landscape of recognition and valuation to um, value the concept of a minor practice. Do we know, do enough about that? No. Um, there is still the media imperative that um, fights against that. But um, if you're an architectural administrator or devising curriculum, I think that's something to really keep in mind and maybe even foreground is the means by which we can value and promote more minor practices in the field. And I'm using capitals there. That's capitalized. Um, so I just wanted you to know a little bit about the ACSA thing. and. Um, uh, the first one that I showed you was more about pathing a career in architecture, and the second one about developing global reach and opportunities. 
Um, and going back to the idea of making career shifts, one of the concepts that they embodied was the idea that obviously as you develop a career, either as a practitioner or an academic or as both, you're developing an expertise. And I guess what we learned from those women was it's good to keep an overview as to how your expertise is developing and where that might lead you, and then be open to taking risks and making change. Um, I know for me to switch from Tulane to IIT was a huge change and a big gamble, um, given the landscape there. Um, but it, it worked out beautifully, and so luck is involved, but also um, being nimble and prescient in terms of what you can do with your expertise is something that we learned from that. And it brought to mind the situation of, oh, oh I want to, hmm, I'll talk about this in a minute. So when I go to the question of the percent of women who are registered, Obviously, women have different career paths. We all know that, and it goes back to the question of valuation. Um, and they have different careers beyond being registered or a member of AIA. Um, and this is a condition, as I've talked to people in other fields, most recently with John Rowe, who is an attorney who went on to lead one of the nation's two largest energy um, enterprises, uh, Exelon, um, and I was telling him about my work, and he said, oh yeah, that problem exists in law, too, and a lot of the women go into parallel paths of working for different kinds of corporations rather than in a traditional practice in order to get around those kinds of live-work balance problems that we have all encountered. Um, and it reminded me of my own brother's, elder brother's experience, who was a pulmonary specialist for the first uh, 30 years of his career, and at age 50 decided he was tired of being on call, and he switched over to being a hospital management specialist and developed a, a really stimulating career out of that switch. So we're worried about our hours and our life-work balance and the efficacy of what we do. Um, and <clears throat> it leads us to a kind of quandary, this whole question of how women are recognized in the field, where are they going after their education, and where do they end up 10 years out, 20 years out, 50 years out. Um, and it, it strikes me that it leaves us with a quandary because some of the, I have been prone to say when I have to do a stump speech that an architectural education is probably the best education of the 21st century, which is being qualified as the century of the visual, not the textual. And we all know that it gives you skills that translate well into all different kinds of endeavors not just the building of buildings. Though I recognize, as one of our um, audience members pointed out yesterday, that that is our core um, knowledge set um, and through which we gain these insights about how the design process becomes a valuable um, set of skills that translate well to other kinds of endeavors. Um, so. We talk about an architectural education's efficacy for various endeavors, not just the building. But then we bemoan the fact that our female recent graduates don't go on to be registered or AIA. So where does that leave us, you know? I mean, should we worry so much about that statistic is the question I'm begging. Um, and I think that there are answers on both sides of the ledger. Uh, there are things that NCARP's trying to do now to um, straighten out and shorten the path to registration that will help everybody, regardless of gender. Um, and then there, there are ways in which um, the growing valuation of 
design skills in our society are making more and more opportunity for an architectural education to land you in some highly interesting uh, ways of working that may not mean registration is that important to you, and that's okay. If we're going to talk about the paradigm shifts that Carol Burns was encouraging us to pursue in yesterday's conversation, um, I would think that uh, one of the, the biggest ones that's taking place, not just in our field, is this attention to work expectations and, and the payback for an architectural career, back, back to that live-work balance. Um, and it looks at how architectural firms handle work for the sake of their employees and those they want to grow and stay with. And then it, it also goes to um, the uh, things that we are doing actively to um, promote different modes of definition to this um, way in which one can work in our profession. And again, this is not isolated to women. It um, is on behalf of all people entering the field who are questioning um, the kind of work life that they are expected to have in an architectural firm and whether that's fair, reasonable, and worth the trouble. And so it reminded me of the work that Peggy Deemer is doing with Bill Minken. Um, what's the name of this enterprise? The Architecture Lobby. The Architecture Lobby, and I encourage you to go find out about it. Um, and they are lobbying on behalf of interns and adjuncts and part-time workers in our field um, so that they will be more highly valued and treated fairly. I hope that was a good characterization. And um, there are glimmers out there in our field. Um, one of the firms that I think has a more enlightened attitude towards this is Gensler our nation's largest firm. And they have learned a lot from maybe other design disciplines about um, how to structure work, how to structure the content of work, and the opportunities for growth within their firm. And everybody goes home by 6 p.m. So um, I guess I, those are some of the questions that I thought might start us on today's conversations. And um, I guess I'll close by just thanking all of you for being here. Um, it's a very, very interesting conversation. It feels rather intimate after big ACSA conferences. Uh, <laughs> and um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, of course, my best thanks to Peggy and Brian and you know, for bringing us here. And I look forward to the future ones that might develop out of this and the other kinds of organized conversations or informal ones that will ensue from this. So we may not be, all be of one voice, but here we are of one concern. So thank you very much. <laughs>